If you've watched the channel before, you'll probably be familiar with this, a 150g vertical spinner Revron. And if you're not, I've got a video covering two years of its development that you can watch here. It's by all accounts been a pretty successful robot, earning a sizeable chunk of real estate on the trophy shelf all by itself. This has on several occasions got me thinking, if it was a bit bigger, say beetle weight size, would it still be as good? So today, let's talk about what it takes to scale an amp weight up to beetle weight size, what works, what doesn't, and we'll cover some of the hard lessons I've learned trying this for the last few years. At this point, I'd also like to say thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and the latest version of the robot. I'll talk more about their services later on. But now, we've got a couple of years of history to dig into. This all started in 2023 when I entered the Bristol Bot Builders Beetleweight Champs. I'd opted to use a similar construction method to what I'd used in the first version of the amp weight. Now I used HTPE, machine side armour and frame rails, held together with standoffs that doubled up as the front wheel axles. These standoffs also provided the mounting points for the front armour package and pivots for the forks. On the amp weight version, I'd used polycarbonate top and bottom panels. However here, I wanted to stiffen up the assembly a little bit, so I opted to use some CNC'd carbon fibre panels in 3mm thickness. The robot was powered by a 4S battery and drive was given courtesy of two Just Cause Dragon motors. These are some particularly potent brushed motors that are used to directly drive the rear wheels and then a set of HDD 3M belts ran to the front wheels. For the weapon setup I was rocking a Drisk, however unlike the Ant this was a belted system and not a hub motor. Up to this point I'd not actually done a belted weapon system and something I couldn't help but notice is that in a lot of beetle weight fights where belts failed the robot lost. So I went on a bit of a hunt for a belt that absolutely would not fail, and I found these. They're particularly strong because they have steel cords that run through them, and I figured if it's less likely to snap, then I'm less likely to lose. Providing drive to that belt is an Overlander Thumper brushless motor, alongside an absolutely enormous 70 amp PSC. The build on this thing went absolutely down to the wire, and in fact we were finishing off in a car park of a screw fix at 6am the morning of the event. As such, the first time the drive and the weapon had been used together was the morning of the event in the box when we were testing everything out. Luckily, it all seemed to work, however the gyro was a fair bit stronger than it is on the amp weight, so that was something I was going to have to be careful of. The first fight at Champs was a three-way melee between Abracagrabra and Firebolt. Tactics for this were simple, try and take out the grabber first, as I figured that was probably the biggest threat, and then see if I can deal with Firebolt the flipper. So, let's see how that went. In the uh, blue corner, so there with the red one with the spinner, I believe that is Revron. Uh, currently attached to the arena wall uh, is um, that is Abracagrabra. Um, immediately that... taking a hit off of Revron. I love the googly eyes on the top. There's a bit of something has already come off. And Abracagrabra there, very close to going into the Uta zone. The spinner's firing up and lifting it into the air. Your first you know, robot you mentioned, the robot difficult to pronounce, Africa Grabia. Absolutely yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're not making it easy for us off the start. We also have Firebolt, is the uh, yellow wedge bot there, uh, coming up on the side of Africa Grabra. And we have seconds. picked up Revron. The pit is now available if someone pushes the pit, but Revron has been flipped over by Africa Grabra. Is that Revron going to be counted out? We've, it's it's going to be a battle of the flippers now between Africa Grabra and Firebolt. It's fair to say that that didn't quite go to plan. It started great, ripping off a piece of side armour and then a wheel, but unfortunately that wheel got jammed in the weapon and stopped it dead. That meant I had no weapon to do damage with, I couldn't self-right, and to make matters worse, when I got turned over, I got high-centred on that wheel. There were also some less obvious problems that came to light after the fight. Firstly, something I thought had been an excellent design decision turned out to be a terrible one. I'd added some cutouts underneath the drive motors to help them stay cool and circulate air. Unfortunately, this allowed debris from the arena to get sucked up into the drive motors, shorting one of them out. Luckily, I could quickly fix this with a bit of capped on tape over those vents, but it's something I needed to note for future versions. The process of replacing this motor led me to problem number two, 
which is this thing is an absolute nightmare to work on. To replace the faulty drive motors, I had to remove 14 fasteners. I also had to remove one of the side armor panels, the top armor panel, a wheel, a drive belt, and then a 15th fastener I'd completely forgot about before finally being able to remove the motor cover. This was not ideal, as it meant we had to delay our next fight. And thinking of that, who have we got next? With any luck, it's another robot that's relatively new, not that experienced, and we could get some of the teething problems ironed out without some really stiff competition. But look, it seems, was not on my side today. We had Icebreaker, one of the most ferocious robots in the UK combat scene, and this was going to be really, really rough. In the blue corner we have Revan, in the red corner, Icebreaker. Icebreaker was... I was, I was about to say Icebreaker looked very threatening in his first fight, but the first thing it does in this fight is hit the ceiling. Well, Revan coming in and getting that perfect purchase, diving right under Icebreaker there as Icebreaker goes up into the air. Two absolutely massive weapons here. There will be sparks flying. And a brilliant dodge by ultimately. Revan as Icebreaker goes into the wall. It's, this is the challenge of, like, you've got the four-wheel drive of Revan versus the two-wheel drive of Icebreaker. There's a lot that can happen here, driving-wise. And Icebreaker with, as you say, the more threatening weapon it is a bigger weapon. But Revan there, absolutely doing damage. But now look at that, loads of shrapnel. I think that's from the top of Icebreaker, but it's hard to say. It's, I think it's white coloured, so it might be from Revan. I'm not sure. The, and I think it's that Revan out. It's Revan stuck in the corner, but they're still rotating. They're up on the wrong side of their robot. So that's giving Icebreaker the opportunity to charge at them into the corner. Revan has tapped out. That's the game. Icebreaker goes back into the main competition, Reverend's out. That's a real shame for Reverend because... That was going so incredibly well, until it wasn't. Initially, I was winning every interaction. The robot was roofing Icebreaker over and over. However, another design flaw would show up, leading to me losing this fight, and it happened right here. Now that might seem insignificant, but that one hit exposed a really stupid error I'd made. At some point, I decided it'd be better if the forks and wedgelets moved together, so I'd added standoffs between the two sets of forks and through the wedgelets. However, when they took a hit, that meant the standoffs got bent and one of the forks was raised slightly. This small change was all it took to go from dominating the ground game and winning every exchange, to losing every time if I went head-on. Unfortunately, going head-on is exactly what I did, and that exposed another weakness. A couple of minutes ago, I said the following, and I found these. They're particularly strong because they have steel cords that run through them. And I figured if it's less likely to snap, then I'm less likely to lose. Now past me forgot something here, and it's called conservation of energy. So in this fight, when the belt took a direct hit and stopped dead, instead of snapping, it reeled in the motor into the back of my weapon. This did a surprising amount of internal damage to the robot, and in fact was worse than the belt just snapping in the first place. So that was my first Beetleweight event. On paper, things didn't look great, going 0 and 2, however in the last fight, some real promise was shown. And still, we had a great day out, met some awesome people, and just had a fun time. Thanks to Mohit, Gage and Dan, who came along with me for this one and helped work on the robot. Without them, it's unlikely it even got in the box in the first place. So between V1 and V2, there was a pretty sizable gap. And in that gap, I continued iterating on the amp weight until I'd arrived at something I was pretty happy with and seemed to work quite well. The plan here was fairly simple. Migrate across all of the changes from the amp weight to the new Beetle design and address some of the issues that had cropped up at Champs 2023. First off, the side armor is now TPU rather than HDPE and it shares the same skirt design as the amp weight. The slope design is helpful for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it can help deflect impacts, making horizontal hits much more likely to glance off. And secondly, it makes the robot slightly wider and gives something to bear against when the robot gyros. This stops it from being prone to flipping over like we saw with V1. Next up, I'd moved away from the really durable belts I'd been running before to 4mm poly belt. Now this stuff is not really renowned for being super durable, but you can have a little bit more give in it and a little bit more slip. So I was hoping that extra compliance would stop the robot grenading itself if the belt did take a hit. And then finally, I'd mounted the weapon motor through the 12mm HDPE main rails. This should provide much better support than the original bracket that I'd used on V1. I'd swapped out the articulating wedgelet assemblies for a single fork, so that ultimately they shouldn't get bent up in the same way and start to lose the ground game. Aside from that, much of the rest of the robot stayed the same, with the same carbon fibre top and bottom panels, the same weapon and drive motors, and the same battery, and control electronics. I ran this design for one event, 
Scar 3 Beetle Weights in Sheffield. Unfortunately I haven't got any video of this event, so you'll have to make do with some dramatic reconstructions. First up we have a robot called Chucky. Chucky is a TPU based flipper. It's incredibly quick and incredibly competitive, having won quite a few competitions. Now unfortunately for me, this fight did not go particularly well. I got box rushed really hard before I really got time to get up to speed, flipped over and at that point I realised the weapon belt was slipping. This meant I was unable to self right and the belt managed to cut its way through the weapon pulley, eventually reaching a set of bolts before cutting itself. So I lost by virtue of being stuck upside down. I replaced the now cut belt, retensioned the weapon pulley and we were good to go for the second fight against the titanium wedge called O'Neill. This fight went much better with me being able to get some good hits in, however unfortunately the weapon belt also started to slip and it also started to eat its way through the pulley. I did win this fight, however by the end of it I had a non-functional weapon system and the drive belts had also started to slip. I was starting to really dislike this poly belt stuff. The final fight of this tournament will be against a robot called Frenzy, an absolutely ferocious and beautifully built 6S four wheel drive vertical spinner. If the robot was functioning properly, this would be a tough fight. Unfortunately, the robot had eaten its only weapon pulley and had no spares, so as a result, we were going into this one weaponless, which was only ever going to end one way. Still, I'd already learned the robot needed a redesign, so this was a really good chance to get some durability testing on the chassis, see what broke when it got absolutely punted around the box, and then add no for the next redesign. Reverend took a few good hits in this one before ultimately being disabled as one of the rear wheels was ripped off and it landed on it when it came back down from the roof. A few interesting bits of damage from this was how badly the 3mm thick hardox wedge I was running got bent and also that one of the side armour retention bolts that runs through the chassis was ripped clean out. Now this was done with the nut still on the end of that bolt so it actually ripped a chunk of chassis out with it. All in all it was a pretty fun day out. The robot hadn't really done what I'd wanted it to and it was clear that in trying to fix some previous design issues I'd created some new ones. I had however managed to get my maiden win at Beetleweight and I'd learned heaps that I could put into a future revision. The main lesson being that I'm using a hub motor and just avoiding weapon belts. So for V3, after all the trouble the belts had given me, I decided to move over to a hub motor setup. Everything else has stayed pretty much the same, and to be honest, I really hated this design. It had too many compromises by trying to keep the chassis as it was, and shoehorning in a hub motor to that existing space. What was really needed was a ground up redesign. So now we arrive at the present day design, V4. The plan for this was simple. Take the amp weight CAD and scale it based on the diameter of the weapon motor at amp weight size and the Just Cause Robotics 4935 weapon motor that I'd be using for the Beetle. In theory, this should make the robot handle about the same and hopefully all the little design flaws that I'd ironed out with the Ant should pay dividends in the Beetle. Now there is a small issue with this strategy and that's that historically for the amp weights I'd 3D printed the chassis. However, I don't really want to do that for the Beetle because I really like the HDPE construction. It's quite a nice material. And it also happens to be a lot less shattery than 3D printed plastics like polycarbonate, nylon or PLAST. Now I don't have the tooling to CNC machine HDPE in anything other than 2D contours. And as you can see by the chassis here, it's very much not a 2D shape. And that's where today's sponsor, PCBWay, comes in. I simply dropped my CAD file, selected the material I wanted, in this case a custom material, and with their much more capable CNC machines, they're able to produce this absolutely gorgeous chassis. And the same goes for the titanium wedge, the titanium forks, a titanium prop mount, and some more HDPE in the form of the weapon uprights. These are absolutely parts I couldn't have made on my own with my tooling capabilities, so it's awesome to see the robot I envisioned come to life without having to worry about tooling restrictions. So if you've got parts you need and you don't have the tooling or time to produce them, PCBWay can be an excellent way to get high quality parts. So, let's get this robot put together in time for the Bristol Bot Builders Champs 2025.
Okay, so we're back. Everything's assembled after a little bit of technical difficulty. And the only thing I haven't done is put in the actual weapon. This is a dummy, so it has the motor, but there are no blades attached to that motor. I did this as a safety precaution as I was doing initial testing, and it turns out it was a really good idea because we have a failsafe issue. Now for some reason, whenever I turn the robot or put the drive to full, the weapon spins up slightly, which is not safe. So I'll save you a lot of troubleshooting that happened over the next few days and just say I tried pretty much everything. Capacitors on all the motors, shielding all the signal wires, physically moving the ESCs away from the noisy drive motors, and absolutely none of it worked. What I ended up doing was replacing the nice 70 amp pariah ESC that I had in there with a random no brand ESC that I'd purchased for a different project. Now this was not ideal as I didn't really trust this thing but at this point I didn't have a whole lot of choice. I hope that doesn't cause any issues. But anyway, that solved the fail safing issue and the robot could drive without the weapon spinning up. So that means we should at least get in the box and be able to have some fights. So now everything's working safely, I can put the weapon blades back on and let's see what this thing can do in the test box. That sounds great, let's hit some stuff. So yeah, um, that's pretty violent. Looks like it's ready to go for champs. Now for that event, I'm gonna do a full recap video. However, if you wanna see a little bit of the destruction, here's a few of the highlights. Thank you for watching. If you want to watch more like this and see the follow-up video to this one, please subscribe to the channel. And if you like this video, please give it a like. Bye for now.